Hi everyone, welcome to this video. My name is Maximilian and in a previous video I already got you started with AWS. In this video I want to show you how you can deploy a Laravel application, including a database, to AWS using AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Let's start. This is the application I want to deploy, a very simple one, but it does use a database behind the scenes. In this application, we can sign up and create blog posts like this is my first post, the very first one. Once we did this, we see an overview over all blog posts. I already created some. And that is the application. Not super amazing, but using a database, which makes it interesting when we talk about deployment. Now you can find this application on GitHub, a link can be found in the video description, and there you can simply clone or download this repository. Now I'll do this too, so I will download it. And I'll work with this one. Now, as I said, I wanna use Elastic Beanstalk to deploy this application. Why? If we switch to AWS, in the end what we'll need is a server and we can spin up a virtual machine instance using their EC2 service. This allows us to spin up virtual servers, so basically like physical ones which we own but just a part on a physical server with the configuration we want. We could do this and then we could install a web server on EC2 and deploy our code onto the instance. We would also have to take care that we set it up in a secure way and do some configuration and we could do all that, but there is an easier way if our goal is to deploy a web application. And that easier way is another service named Elastic Beanstalk. Behind the scenes, Elastic Beanstalk will use EC2, it will start such a server for us, but it will do also all the other configuration we want to do and it makes it easy for us to ship our code onto the instance, to manage different versions, different environments like a testing or production environment and all these things. Well with that, let's get started with Elastic Beanstalk. For that, click simply on get started and give your application a name. I'll name it Laravel Simple Block. Next, you need to choose a platform and since we're using Laravel, this obviously should be PHP, since Laravel is a PHP framework. We don't want to start with a sample application, instead we want to upload our own code and now it would be tempting to pick the zip file you downloaded from GitHub, right? That won't work though. The zip file which you upload here should contain all the source files and not a folder which contains all the source files. Therefore, Simply go to the folder you just downloaded and extract it. This will give you a folder and now in this folder select all the files and compress them, zip them again with your favorite zipping tool. However, before you do so, make sure you do one thing. You see that .env.example file? Laravel manages a couple of global settings in its .env file. And by default, this .env file is not shared when hosting or when shipping your code to a code repository like GitHub, which is why here you only have a dummy file and not an actual one. You should copy that file and rename it to .env without .example. And now let's open that file with your favorite text editor. I'm using Sublime here. And now you can edit it. And one thing we do have to edit is we have to assign an app key here. All the other settings can stay as they are for now. I'll change this from local to prod though, but this is up to you. You can set any value here. The URL can also stay as it is for now. So we need that API key here, that app key to be precise. And to get one, we can use the artition command to generate one. However, for that we will need PHP installed in our machine, so make sure that you have PHP installed. You can then simply navigate into your folder and run PHP, artition, and then a command. But for this to work, we actually need to do one other thing first. We need to install all the dependencies. If we have a look at our folder, we see that it got no vendor folder here. So all the dependencies, including the Laravel framework itself, are missing. 
That is normal, you always distribute your code or ship it to GitHub without dependencies like these, since you can easily install them using Composer in this case. Make sure you have Composer installed on your machine, link can be found in the video description, and then in this project folder you download it and extract it. You can run Composer install. And this will now install all the dependencies this project needs, including Laravel. Now it will take a couple of seconds. Once it is done, we can use the artition command to generate a key. So it did finish for me. Now you can run a new command still in that folder, php artition key colon generate. And this will generate this application key and automatically store it in this .env file, as you can see, if you open it again. Here it is. With that the project is prepared and now we can select all these files inside this folder, so only the files in this folder, and compress them. This will generate a new zip file on Windows, of course, use a program like zip or winzip or winrar. And with that compressed, you may take your compressed file, rename it to whatever you like, I'll name it Laravel Simple Block V1 and go to Elastic Beanstalk with it. Because here we need to upload our code and now we get a zip file with the code. So let's choose the code here. Choose that zip file we just created which holds all our code including the dependencies, including the vendor folder and let's click Upload. Now as you can see in the bottom left this now ships our code to Amazon. Then. Elastic Beanstalk will spin up the EC2 instance we need and will ship our code onto the instance and also configure that instance to hold a web server and so on. Before it does so though, we need to go through the remaining steps of the configuration. We could click create application or we have a view look at the other options we can set up. Here we can for example choose which kind of preset we want to use. I'll go with the low cost one which stays within this free tier as long as you don't have multiple of these apps. But of course you could choose to a more production ready one. And you can change the environment settings. I'll name the environment here differently. I'll name it prod. You can choose any name you like. And you can manage different environments on Elastic Beanstalk, for example, for a testing environment, a production environment, a staging environment, new feature environment, whatever you need. Now, with this all set up, the default settings should be fine. And we can click on Create App. Now, this will, as I just said, spin up that EC2 instance, ship our code onto it, set everything up there, and I'll be back once this finished. The environment successfully launched for me and with that we get a link where we can visit our application. So let's click it. And there we see forbidden. Now do you have an idea where this error might come from? It's tricky to spot, but do you have an idea? Well, to find out where this error comes from, let's have a look at our Laravel application structure. This is the folder we uploaded. And there, as you probably are aware, if you know Laravel, the main entry point where the request is handled first is inside the public folder. Here we got that index.php file which is responsible for getting any incoming request and then funneling it through the Laravel framework you could say. Now we uploaded this whole folder to Beanstalk and therefore Beanstalk shipped it to our web server on EC2 on this virtual server. The issue is the incoming request therefore doesn't hit the public folder it hits this folder, the whole folder, and there we simply don't handle it. This is, in the end, the reason for this error. We can easily change this though. Let's go to the configuration of our environment, of the prod environment here. And there, under software configuration, we can configure anything related to our server which is running here. So if we click on this settings icon, we can set a document root. And this is exactly what we need here. Here we can decide from which folder, from which subfolder, the server should in the end serve our files or where the request should basically be handled. And we can set this to slash public so that now we target the public folder and there it will then automatically reach the index.php file. With this tiny change, we will fix this error. Now what else can you configure here? A couple of server specific settings about compression for example if you want to display errors 
and until when you want to or when you want to terminate uh, incoming requests and some settings about logging. Now, we don't need that, but this public thing here is really interesting. With that, let's click apply here. And this will update our environment. Now this operation takes a couple of seconds. We can still reach our application during that time frame, most of the time at least. But then at some point it will restart the web server. And after that, if we visit the application again, this looks much better. Unfortunately, the next issue isn't far away. If we click on register and try to register here, we get an error. We get a SQL error that the connection was refused. And this makes sense. We're trying to connect to a database in the Laravel code, but we got no database here. By default, no database is created on that virtual server, which is spun up by Elastic Beanstalk behind the scenes. Now we could install a server on this EC2 instance. By the way, you can always have a look at this instance by simply going to the EC2 service. And there under instances, you see that there's one running instance. This is the one which was spun up by Elastic Beanstalk. So we can see that here. And as I said, we could install a database, a MySQL database, for example, on that instance. But the issue we would then have is that we have to fully manage that database. It then runs on our own server. We have to back the data up. We have to make sure that we are protected against failures if the server for some reason goes down. If we ever want to switch the, the hardware or upgrade to a bigger server, we'll have to do everything about that switch on our own. So we have to fully manage the database and that is a huge disadvantage. For big enterprises, that's of course doable and pretty common. But for you, there is a much simpler way of quickly adding a database to your stack. Let's go to configuration again. And as you can see, we are in the web tier or here are a couple of options related to the web tier. So to our website, you could say. Now, if we scroll down, you see there also is a data tier. And here we don't see any options as of now, but we can attach a database to our Elastic Beanstalk environment here. We can create a new RDS database and RDS stands for Relational Database Service. It's another service provided by AWS, which allows us to spin up database instances, so database servers with a configuration of our choice, again, regarding the power, and then with a database on these servers. Now, this is a fully managed service. So here we don't have to take care about backing the data up or updating software. That's all done by AWS. And there also is a free tier option available here so that we even don't pay a dime for the first year as long as again we stay in some boundaries as set on the pricing page by AWS. So let's click create a new RDS instance and we're taking to this wizard. Here we could create this instance based on an existing snapshot which would basically copy old data into this to be created database. I don't want that, I want to start with a blank database. We can choose the DB engine and I'll go with MySQL here. MySQL is included in the free tier and the version of the engine. And as you can see, we got a couple of different versions, 5.6.29, 3.4, 3.5, stick to 6.29. The instance class is a really big one here. I'll scale this down to T2 micro to stay in the free tier. And then we have to set up a root username and password with which we can access this database server. I'll choose root here and also a password. Now here it is set up to automatically create a snapshot if this database server is ever going to get shut down so that the data is safe before it shuts down and that we don't want to copy it across multiple availability zones which is fine for this example. With that let's hit apply and now this is starting a new database instance using that RDS service and on that database instance, so on this database server, it will also automatically create a new database. This will take a couple of minutes, but whilst this is starting up, we can already think about a new issue we have to solve. In our environment, in our application, if we have a look at the .env file, which again manages our settings, here we see that the database connection is set up. 
by default, it uses the local host, database, username. These are all settings for our local development environment for Homestead specifically in this case. Obviously, these values are not correct if we use the database hosted on some server created or managed by AWS. Now, instead, we will have to enter the host, so the address of this database server, then the name of the exact database on that server and our credentials. Now, I could already enter the credentials we just set up in a couple of uh, seconds ago, actually, but it would be nice if there would be a more dynamic way of getting access to these values. In the end, Elastic Beanstalk is managing everything, and as it turns out, it also gives you access to the database settings on the server Super Global. How does that work? We can go to the config folder in the lateral project and there we have this database PHP file. In here we manage the configuration for the database. And if we open this, again with any text editor of your choice, you see that here we can configure which default connection is used, you see that's MySQL, and then for that connection, things like the host, the port, the database username and password. And these are exactly the things we need to define or we need to pass. Now outside of this return statement at the beginning of the file, we can now define a couple of globals. The first one could be named RDS host name and the name here is totally up to you. You can name this global whatever you like. The value is not up to you though. Here we should access our server super global and on that super global we have the RDS host name variable or property we can access. This property is populated by Elastic Beanstalk in the end. It passes us this value with every incoming request so that we have a chance of dynamically retrieving our database value and accessing the database. And whenever we change something about the database, we therefore don't have to adjust our Laravel code. So that is the host name. I need more than that. For example, we also want to adjust the username here or get the username and we can get this on this server super global and there on the username property, RDS username. Then we want to extract the password and we want to get this too. And no worries, this request is of course not sent from your client. This is something Elastic Beanstalk passes your application once the request is basically or has reached the backend already. So this is not exposed to any users. And finally, the name of the database. This is a database created by Beanstalk. We have no idea what it's naming it. And here we can simply retrieve it with, without having to worry about the name. With these globals set up, we can go down and for example here, replace the host with the RDS host name global, which will hold the host. The database here can be replaced with the DB name and the username obviously with the username, whilst we can set the password well equal to RDS password. Whoops, RDS password here. With this, this database PHP file is prepared and is now able to well retrieve that data or that information dynamically and therefore connect to the database. That's not all. We also need to change something else. Remember that we could only choose for or between database MySQL versions 5.6 something. We couldn't choose 5.7 and Laravel 5.4, the version I'm using here, actually requires MySQL 5.4 seven or higher, or a certain command at the point of time we run migrations will fail. We can already set this up too, and this is done in the app folder under providers, under app service provider. There, if you open that file, you should first use schema here at the top to import that schema facade, and then in the boot function, simply execute schema, and there the default string length method and set it to 191. This will override the default level otherwise assumes, which is not possible when using or which will lead to an error when using an older MySQL database version as we're doing, as we were forced to do in our Beanstalk app. With this command, however, we will prevent this from happening. It leads us to a new issue though, or a new thing we have to think about, migrations. If we were to deploy our code to our server right now, 
we would probably be able to connect to the database. But what do you have to do the first time you set up your Laravel application on a server, be that your development environment or the production environment? You have to run your migrations. Because of course, in this project too, I set up a couple of migrations here in the database migrations folder. One for the users table and one for the posts table. And we have to run these migrations right at the start when we deploy this app for the first time to make sure that these tables are created in the database. Otherwise nothing will work. Now for that we can run the php artisan migrate command. But how do we run that command on a server which is not on our local machine? There are different ways of doing that. You could connect to this EC2 instance, which was created by Beanstalk, via SSH. You could set up a SSH connection and then manually execute this command in the Laravel folder on that server. That is doable. On Windows, you will need an extra program or application to run SSH though. A different alternative, or generally an alternative, is to take advantage of a behavior or Elastic Beanstalk offers to you. You can create a new folder here in your project and name this .eb extensions. Now the name is important, it should have a leading dot and it should be named eb extensions after the dot. Inside that folder, you now can create files which have to end with .config, which will be run by Elastic Beanstalk every time you deploy a new version. And therefore here, I can simply create a new file where we first enter container underscore commands. And this is not something you can choose. This is a command or a setup a configuration basically detected by Elastic Beanstalk. Then indent with a tab we're using the YAML format here and add a name of the command. This is now again totally choosable by you. The commands you list here will be executed in alphabetical order though and more information about this file can be found in the link in the video description. I'll name it 01 init db colon again indent and then here command colon and then the command between double quotation marks which you want to execute. And this will be php artisan migrate. This will now migrate all your files. Make sure to implement this fix I showed a couple of seconds ago before you run this. So this fix regarding the default string length. And with this you can now save this file in your root project folder and name it for example init.config. Now of course make sure to in the end place it in this .eb extensions folder here. And with that, this file will get executed by Elastic Beanstalk and the command in there will be executed too, thus migrating our files. Now, of course, it will execute this whenever you deploy a new version too. So for newer versions, you should probably not include that because migrate would fail then since the database tables already would exist. And that is why connecting via SSH and running the command by doing this or by, well, having that connection might be the preferable way for such one-time only tasks like this one. But I want to show this capability here too. And of course, there are a couple of ways of automating this whole Elastic Beanstalk process even more. For example, with the Elastic Beanstalk CLI. Back to our example here though. We can switch back to the Elastic Beanstalk console and it just finished here and with that we can go back and create a new bundle we want to deploy. So let's first delete the old one and then select everyone, everything here and compress it again. This again will take a couple of seconds and this new zip file now has to be deployed again. I'll first rename it to Laravel simple block v2 but the name is totally up to you. And back in the Elastic Beanstalk console, you can now click on upload and deploy to upload a new application version. Here, I'll choose this new file, which holds the changes regarding the dynamic database connection, this initialization script, and this fix for Laravel 5.4 with older MySQL databases. And we can now hit deploy. This will now upload the code again and then exchange the code, the old code with this new one. 
Whilst doing that, it will not restart the EC2 instance or anything like that. So we can still access our application whilst it's doing that. But after a couple of seconds, the new code will be live and can be used by us. It already finished. Let's click this file here and let's now try this registration again. I'll again enter my email address here and my password and click register and I get a connection refused error. Well, it's kind of deceiving. If we have a look at the broad environment, we see this okay and this check mark and everything looks great. But actually if we scroll down, we see that it failed to deploy the application. So it simply didn't update the code, it rolled back to our old application code. Now this error can be really strange. At first it looks like we messed something up in our YAML since it tells us invalid YAML. But actually this is related to how Mac, and you can see a hint here, stores hidden folders. Even though we can't see it here, there is like an extra subfolder in there. You can simply fix this error or this strange behavior by going into the terminal into that folder, so where this zip file can be found, and executing zip dash d, laravel simple block, the zip file, and then underscore underscore mac os x forward slash backslash star. And this will remove this annoying folder in there. With this out of the way, we can try uploading this again. So let's choose this zip file again. Now we have to define our own version label since the old one is already taken. Since we already tried it with the same file name from which it infers that. And now let's see if that works. So let's wait for this to finish uploading. And now hopefully it again, it will replace our application code. This time hopefully successfully and hopefully it now is successful running this initialization command, setting up our database and adding the tables in there. Now this looks much better. Let's visit our web page again and let's try this registration process here again. Now we're forwarded. Now it seems to successfully create a user. This already hits the database. And let's enter a post and see if that also works. And it does. Now we got the application working on Elastic Beanstalk with a dynamic connection to the database. As you saw, there were some gotchas we had to take care about. As I mentioned, there are of course more flexible or better ways of deploying everything through the Elastic Beanstalk CLI. You can automate a lot of the stuff you saw here. But this is how you can ship your applications and there is nothing wrong about this approach. So if you got a Laravel application which you want to host, this is how you could do it and for the first year, as long as you don't use any other services at least, this will be for free. That is how that works. In another video, I want to take a closer look at Elastic Beanstalk and what we can do in the configuration, what all this stuff on the left here is about. Hopefully see you there. Bye.